So that should now be recording. Cool. Um, right, so, um, right, I think we're ready to go now. So, um, yes, we'll uh, begin uh, today's lunch talk um, delivered by Ingenel. Um, thank you, Nick. Um, so, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, testing the Milgromian dynamics theory using local white binaries. So I'm going to explain about uh, that in a moment and also why I've shown a triple system here rather than a binary. Um, so I'll get on to all that momentarily. So just to give a brief introduction, um, galaxy rotation curves. Uh, so if you plot the rotation speed against distance, it typically looks like this and goes flat in the outskirts. But if you apply Newtonian gravity to the distribution of visible mass, it should kind of follow this sort of Keplerian decline because most of the mass is within that distance range. Uh, so this uh, discrepancy is well known, but another way of showing it is as a re relation between the observed gravity, uh, so V squared over R, uh, needed to hold the galaxy together against the Newtonian gravity you expect from just the visible mass. And of course, uh, the uh, line of equality shown here uh, is uh, not where the data lies. The data are a long way above it. Um, the important thing, though, is that here we've only got one galaxy. On the right, I've actually shown 153 galaxies uh, with 2700 data points, and you can see them all following this very tight track known as the radial acceleration relation. Another thing just to notice about the scale here is that the um, numbers here are very small. So the accelerations here are much, much smaller than in the solar system. Even the gravity on sort of our most distant spacecraft on the voyages is uh, about 10 to the minus 6 meters per second squared. So a lot higher than anything shown here. So that's the disk galaxies. Uh, but uh, you also have something similar in elliptical. So in elliptical galaxies, the problem is uh, you do not really show how much of the support against, uh, well, how much of the support against gravity is coming from uh, ordered circular motion versus like uh, pressure or, or random motion. So there's basically two limits. Either it's all coming from pressure, or it's all coming from rotation. And these two panels basically show the two limits. So in the right panel, you've got um, a hot gas halo where sort of collisions between the gas uh, atoms and ions uh, mean that there isn't any ordered motion. It's just random pressure. Uh, and on the right, you've got a, a subdominant, but nonetheless rotationally supported gas disk. So you um, so in this panel, you can you've got data from several different galaxies. And the thing I showed on the last slide, the radial acceleration relation in disk galaxy is showing this blue shading. But the new data is like these colored points from different galaxies, and they also follow the area very nicely. Then from these uh, three S0 galaxies, again, it's the same thing. So lines in the background are, are the spiral galaxy area. Um, but the new data also track that. Um, so. This brings me on to the Mond theory, which is very interesting because I know some of you are familiar with this. So Mond basically is saying uh, that uh, if you that you should understand galaxies without cold dark matter halos, uh, and that means that if the Newtonian gravity of the baryons is much greater than a zero, this which is a new fundamental constant of nature, g should equal g n. Uh, the Newtonian gravity, but in the opposite limit, g should equal square root of a0 gn. So this is called the deep mod limit. And a0 is found empirically just like the g in like Newtonian gravity. Um, importantly, uh, you need to apply this uh, equation for more complicated geometries. So in spherically symmetric situations, g would just be some function nu uh, of the gravitational field strength times the gn. So there'd be an algebraic sort of relation between G and GN. In more complicated geometries, you need this field equation. Um, and we've reviewed more nicely in, in this review uh, uh, paper, uh, which 
apparently it's been quite popular. Um, now, there's also relativistic modern theories where gravitational waves propagate at the speed of light. So I, I'll, uh, this talk isn't really about relativistic tests, but I'll just show one slide on relativistic tests, just so you're aware. Uh, first of all, in MON, the relation between the gravitational field and the light deflection angle is the same as in GR. Doesn't have to be, but typically people construct MON to be like that. Um, and uh, uh, the, of course, the difference in MON is that G is enhanced for the same mass distribution. Um, so if you try and look at stacked galaxy galaxy weak lensing results, they actually trace basically the same radial acceleration relation, but they kind of carry it on down to much lower accelerations. Um, in other words, the slope it continues being a half down to like as far as they can get, uh, which is several hundred kiloparsec out from the galaxies through the use of stacking. That means they can get down to five orders of magnitude below a0 in the GN. Now, of course, because uh, G was supposed to go square root of A0 GN, that means there are only two and a half orders of magnitude below A0 in terms of the actual gravity. Right. Um, so uh, just some recent results which have used this, uh, these observations to rule out uh, some interesting models in, in case you are interested, I can answer more questions about that. Um, now, uh, I'll get on to the important uh, business of wide binaries. Important thing is that MON is an acceleration dependent theory, which means for any uh, mass, um, if you want the gravity to be in the MON regime, you need to go beyond its MON radius, which is square root of GM over A0. Now, for the sun, that's only 7 kilo A, which is very small compared to the galaxy. That's because its mass is much smaller. Now, uh, this means that dark matter would not affect a local wide binary uh, because basically the gravity from a dark halo with the fixed density scales with the size. Uh, and therefore, even if a massive CDM halo exists around the galaxy, it wouldn't, I think it would have a 10 to the minus 5 A0 sort of effect, uh, which is negligible. Now, I'll come on to the effect of MON in more detail later on. Uh, but suffice to say, it's not negligible. Uh, and this has been known for, for many years. Um, now, in, in any individual system, one can't really do this uh, test properly because of uh, projection effects and also orbital phase effects. It might just be caught in apple center or something. The velocity is lower. Um, so you really, you need a statistical test, uh, which is the uh, wide binary test or, or WBT. Now, uh, this is supposed to be done in terms of the V tilde parameter, which is the relative velocity between the stars divided by the Newtonian circular velocity of the binary. Uh, OK, that doesn't mean the neutral gravity is, is correct, but it means that it should still it's still the best way to parameterize the any deviations that might arise. Um, so that's the V tilde parameter, uh, but uh, we use only the sky projected quantities in this because they're more accurate. That, that will have the effect of reducing V tilde further below the 3D band. Uh, because we see V rel will be lower, but also the Newtonian VC will be higher if R is just the projected R. Um, so the main prediction is that in more local wide binaries would orbit 20% faster uh, in the um, asymptotic regime of large separations. Um, so if you increase the separation further, the orbital velocity will still be 20% higher than the Newtonian expectation. Um, and basically, uh, the, the factor you get is the same as the factor by which the Newtonian rotation curve of the Milky Way, of its baryons, must be enhanced in MOND. So I'll show the rotation curve on the next slide to give you an idea of what that looks like. The orange rotation curve is what the galaxy would do if uh, our physics actually worked, basically. Um, the problem is the data is uh, up here. The discrepancy is much smaller here than in many other cases, but it's still noticeable. Uh, There's basically like a 25% enhancement. Um, but because of the complications of more, the enhancement to the local wide binaries is slightly less. Uh, but in general, though, the main thing is that the enhancement factor you get here 
should show up in white binaries. Um, that's basically the, the idea. Um, so now we, uh, yeah, so I haven't shown any real data before, but the, for, for the white binaries, but here you can see the distribution of V tilde uh, from the Gaia DR2 in red. And in, importantly in Mon, uh, if you neglect the galactic EFE, which is not really legitimate, but if you do that, you get the green curve, the prediction, uh, which is completely wrong. So that's one thing to understand. But um, it, th this doesn't really tell you much because Mon has to have the EFE. Um, if you include the EFE, you'd get the pink curve, which is very similar to the Newtonian curve in black. Uh, so they're quite hard to distinguish, at least with DR2. Uh, but maybe we'll get third time lucky, it's with many things. Um, the important thing, another important thing though, is that the red data have this extended tail. Now this extended tail was uh, expected kind of a priori, we mentioned about this in some detail, before seeing such data that uh, closed binaries would create such a tail. Because it's declining, it's almost certainly not line of sight contamination that will create a rising tail. Um, and also it's not like measurement errors. Um, so come on to like some more uh, about the closed binaries later on. But uh, that's basically what a V tilde distribution like, looks like. Um, so this brings me on to, yeah. So how do you get the V tilde values? Uh, so we use similar methods to the Pretorius and Sutherland like Queen Mary group. Uh, basically, you need, first we need to get the mass from the absolute Gaia band magnitude. Uh, now the important thing to understand is uh, MOND is equivalent to like a 45% boost to the gravity. It's equivalent to about 1.8 magnitude change in the uh, absolute magnitude of a star. So it's quite a significant effect. Um, uh, then we need the systemic RV because if the white binary is receding as a whole, uh, that affects the motion within the sky plane a little bit. Um, we don't need to worry about the small differences in RV between the stars, because when you project that in the sky plane, that will become negligible. But the 20 kilometers a second, perhaps systemic RV is, is needed. And uh, you also need to know like which star is in front, which one's behind. Uh, well, you don't need to know that, but you need to sort of allow for uncertainty in the relative heliocentric distance. And the way we do that is say that if you know the 2D projected separation, the 3D separation can be inferred statistically from that. It's basically like saying the line of sight depth of the system is, is a Gaussian with width equal to the 2D separation. Roughly speaking, that's what we're doing. Um, unless the system is so nearby that the parallax uncertainties are so precise, you actually do know the 3D structure. Then we switch to using the Gaia parallaxes. We just see which one's more accurate, basically. Um, now, uh, to propagate uncertainties in parallax and proper motion, we use the full 5 by 5 Gaia covariance matrix, uh, which I diagonalized myself for each of these systems. Uh, now, the thing is, um, there's five parameters because there's position also is one. Uh, there's two parameters for that, but we don't care about that. So we just kind of marginalizing over it. But we do need these three parameters. Uh, they are critical for the white binary test. And also, if you uh, each time the parallax is changed, the absolute magnitude is changed. So there's some slight error in that. Um, now, uh, yeah, uh, we also posted the detailed plan for how we would do the white binary test in advance uh, in autumn 2021 uh, to mitigate the moral hazards that are obviously associated with. Um, such a critical test of gravity. Um, now, uh, this shows you the uncertainties in the V tilde, uh, which are very small. Uh, what we did is we asked for a maximum error of only 0.1 for V tilde equals 0 to 2, which is a critical range that's kind of most relevant for the white binary test. Um, this is a very small uncertainty, um, which uh, because you'd add it, so this would kind of add in quadrature to the intrinsic dispersion in beta, it's so all half maybe. That's roughly where the main peak is. And the, the broadening is, is very small. Um, so guy errors are, are very small. And uh, in our actual analysis, we uh, didn't actually consider the errors as such. We simply restricted our sample to systems 
where the V-tilde uncertainty is already very small, and just consider those systems, uh, which greatly simplified the, the analysis, um, but also should be legitimate, as we've argued here. Um, so this kind of gets the best compromise between accuracy and sample size. Um, now, the uh, observed distribution of ASCA and V-tilde is the main thing we are comparing with the uh, simulations or with the, with the model. Um, what is uh, shown here is, is the exact pixelation scheme that is used um, in, the, in the actual analysis. Uh, there's just over 10,000 systems. Uh, and we've just come across <coughs> how many there are in each pixel. Uh, the important thing is, um, yeah, so first of all, there's a main peak in the VTLA distribution, and then it kind of drops off. This is this extended tail I was showing earlier. We think is mostly closed binaries. It kind of uh, disappears here. There isn't much here. There's a gap here. The reason for that is uh, the closed binary tail basically gets diluted at high separations at high ASCII. The reason is that the closed binary motion uh, doesn't really depend on the white binary, but because you're dividing the velocities by VC in order to get V tilde, we see the circle of velocity, expected circle of velocity is low at this end. So the um, high V tilde tail gets diluted over a much larger range of V tilde essentially. Uh, but we only consider systems with V tilde up to five. Uh, so the end result of that is you get um, a peak due to genuine white binaries, you don't have much of a tail anymore because it's been diluted out. So closed binary tail kind of isn't there. But uh, when you get to very high V tilde, you, you get systems appearing there. And this is uh, almost certainly just the line of sight contamination, um, which I'll go on to later. But that's basically what is creating this uh, gap in the middle uh, and high R sky. Uh, so, um, the uh, I've explained uh, this before, but just to show you like what actually the force law in MON looks like in a bit more detail using numerical calculations. Uh, the uh, force, uh, the angle averaged um, force between the white binaries, the radial gravity, which is what's holding it together. Um, is higher than G N by some factor, which is obviously what one at very small separations. But then as you go to larger and larger separations, it rises and then it sort of flattens out. The red line is something you can get analytically. So that's all sensible. That's in the Q mod, which is much more computationally tractable. There's an older version of mod from the 80s, which would have given you this blue line instead as the asymptotic limit. So it's very similar. Uh, there's also numerical aqual results, which are only valid in this sort of regime. They're only valid at low uh, EFE strengths. Um, well, yeah, I think they're only valid to the low end. Uh, the asymptotic limit in that equation is not valid uh, for white binaries, so that, that's why it doesn't hit the solid blue line. Uh, but basically, the difference between aqua and Q1 are very small, uh, and uh, in general, the other thing I wanted to mention, of course, is the actual sensitivity of Gaia DR3 to this function. And uh, there you can see clearly that it's extremely sensitive, especially when you consider that the R in 3D is going to be slightly more than R sky. Um, so there is obviously a great deal of sensitivity to the MON uh, with the Gaia DR3 white binaries. So we should be able to get definitive results. Um, now, before we get on to the more detailed analysis, I'll just show a simple look at the median V tilde. Uh, this is uh, done in 10 bins, which have uh, equal number of systems. And the thing you're binning in is a proxy for the internal acceleration. It's the um, uh, projected separation divided by the mod radius. Uh, so that's the proxy for the internal acceleration. Now, if you do that, the important thing to understand is that any any genuine MON signal should be in the main peak region of the V tilde distribution. So at less than about two, because in Newtonian gravity, the limit is square root of two. And in MON, it'll be 20% higher. But um, certainly, if you consider all the systems up to 2.5, you you'll capture any genuine signal in there. You won't be losing any genuine signal by doing that. If you try to go more, uh, go beyond that, though, 
you'll only include more contamination. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's not really helpful to consider like a higher V tilde limit than, than two and a half. Um, so just bear that in mind when seeing these results, which show you results for V tilde less than 1.52 and 2.5, um, which are all very flat. And you can see that that uh, flat grid line here kind of worked really well. Um, this gray line is kind of what you'd expect in more. Uh, there should be a 20% rise going from like very low values up to one, and then it should flatten. Uh, so that's not what happened. The neutronian expectation is, is confirmed, but the modern expectation seems to be completely incorrect on this slide. Um, except if you look at the V tilde less than five case or the full sample. But as I argued, that's not a good way of looking at the results because you just allow in more contamination. And the contamination would indeed be more important at high separations, but that's also lower acceleration. So that can lead to a fake mod signal. Um, so the pink curve contains like kind of fake mod signal, um, a mod like signal. It's still not really like the gray line. But anyway, it, from this it looks. Uh, ah, I also forgot to mention that um, because there's about a thousand systems in each bin, the uncertainties are typically are 0 0.02 ish. So it makes sense that uh, the black line looks like uh, a little bit jagged. Uh, right. So. Uh, now you're probably wanting to see what happens to the more detailed analysis. So I'll explain that in in, in some detail uh, what we did. So first of all, you need um, the wide binary orbital motion to be modeled, which we do by computing a 2D gravitational field for a point mass in the galactic EFE, uh, which is all right for this problem. We're treating the wide binary as entirely just one point mass plus a test particle. Which is fine in the Newtonian case, but we've uh, <coughs> shown before that in MOND it's also fairly accurate to do that. Uh, certainly in the asymptotic limit of large separations, it becomes like totally legitimate also in MOND. Um, and there's basically no intermediate regime. Work. There is a narrow intermediate regime where it's slightly inaccurate. So that's the gravitational field. Orbits are integrated in that gravitational field for 20 revolutions. And um, we consider a dense 2D grid of viewing angles at each time step. So it's quite expensive work, not as much as some of the other steps I'll come on to. Um, the higher, uh, right, so we consider like a range of orbital eccentricity distributions parameterized by gamma. Higher gamma means orbits are slightly more eccentric. So in, in this, in these models, gamma is actually used as the slope of the eccentricity distribution, assuming it's linear. Um, later on, we'll use it in a slightly different way. But the main thing is, um, that you can see that for all the different eccentricity distributions, the uh, Newtonian distribution of V tilde is very different to the Mond one. So there's clear water between the two theories, uh, and uh, that um, is not meaningfully affected by uh, uncertainty in the eccentricity distribution. Um, so we set up an interpolation between the Newtonian and Mond gravity laws with where with this parameter alpha graph, which is zero for Newtonian gravity, one for mod. So I'll have to take values slightly outside this range as well, between basically minus two and plus 3.6, just in case uh, some unexpected outcomes arise. Um, but yeah, that's that's the basic thing for the wide binary test. But there's more complications to it. As I mentioned before, you have closed binaries um, where you need to include uh, which uh, there's a lot of evidence for, uh, including that why binaries with a high V tilde have these poor guy astrometric fits, uh, which we'll probably learn a bit more about in DR4. Um, but most of these closed binaries should be identifiable with follow up. Now, to model these closed binaries, you're obviously like a critical part of the problem. To model these closed binaries, you need uh, some likelihood of a star having an undetected closed binary companion, which we um, assume has the same major axis distributed like according to this OPIC law, which I'll come on to in a sec, um, between 0.1% of the maximum allowed and the maximum allowed separation. The maximum allowed separation is like a fixed fraction of the wide binary semi-major axis. Um, 
the most expensive steps arise from having like possibly a close binary around both of the stars, which we'll see is like quite possible and has to be included. Um, so what do closed binaries actually do to the white binary test? Well, what one of the effects is that so if you assume the closed binary is so nearby that the light falls in the same sort of pixel, then you get extra light from the undetected, so-called undetected star, which is good, and that raises the inferred mass, but not enough. It doesn't raise the inferred mass as much as it should do because of the steep mass luminosity relation. And this leads to a hidden mass effect. So basically like, uh, yeah, it, that's that's the concept of the steep mass luminosity relation. Um, now, so that, that's basically this hidden mass effect, which is shown in red. And basically, if you didn't have the blended light, you'd have this upper curve. So the fact that you're getting some light from the so-called undetected star is helping, but it's not completely mitigating the damage. Um, you also get recoil velocity, which is an important, it's very important. And probably the effect you first think of if I told you was close by your companions. But uh, in, again, because of light from the undetected star, what you're really caring about is the offset between the photocenter and the barycenter, um, which vanishes for an exactly equal mass close binary. So actually in the exactly equal mass case, uh, the, this recoil velocity effect isn't important. So the black curves show the basically the recoil velocity effect, uh, the photocenter barycenter offset in, in particular. And that's why it drops to zero if you have like an exactly equal mass closed binary companion. So if you're uh, looking at a star where it's actually two stars with uh, an exactly equal mass, which is the extreme limit. Uh, in reality, there's some kind of region where it's most problematic and it's less problematic on either side of, for the mass ratio. So you can probably see from all uh, this as well that the assumption on the closed binary mass ratio distribution will have some impact on the wide binary test, I'll show you later on that the impact of this is very small. Um, then the final ingredient in the model is some allowance for line of sight contamination, which I showed you earlier is kind of important towards high separations and V tilde. Here, um, the thing is, uh, chance alignments of field stars wouldn't really matter very much, but if you assume stars formed in the same star cluster, and they might sometimes just randomly pass by each other. Uh, then maybe the line of sight contamination is somewhat important. Um, what we did is a very simple model. We didn't worry about all that, but we just said like, let's assume the relative velocity can, in principle, it, it can be much higher than the wide binary orbital velocity because that's very slow. So basically you just have standard line of sight contamination where it's proportional to R and V because these are both 2D quantities. So it's just like looking at concentric analyte. The area here for fixed width is proportional to the radius, but that also applies in velocity space. Um, then uh, the thing is, if you do this in the space of V tilde and R sky, then the R sky dependence cancels. Um, you're just left with the V tilde. Um, so we just fit this distribution to the data, basically. And you'd expect like a few percent maybe well, you'd expect FLOS to be inferred as a few percent in the end, roughly speaking. Um, so then now that we've sort of explained the ingredients in the detailed model, what we do is we vary the model parameters. So there's a gravity law, there's a uh, distribution of wide binary semi-major axis, axis, which is assumed to follow one over A law until some break radius, and then it follows a steeper law with slope PA. Uh, which is less than minus one. Then you have the eccentricity distribution, which we're treating as a power law uh, following recent recommendations, which I'll give a reference for later. For the closed binaries, you have like the incidence of closed binaries, the maximum allowed closed binary separation. Then there's the line of sight contamination fraction. Um, so how do we use this? We run a gradient ascent to get the best model parameters. We start these uh, with the alpha graph fixed to a half to uh, mitigate like the moral hazards as I was saying. Uh, then you, we run an MCMC chain 
so this is basically a, an approach we used previously. It reduces the um, complexity slightly because you're starting with the best model. Uh, then we use binomial statistics at the pixel level to get a probability for that pixel having as many systems as it does, given the model prediction, how many systems it should have uh, for the fixed samples, overall sample size. The probabilities are multiplied together, but that would lead to very small numbers. So we add them in log space. Um, so yeah, we this led to each model having a marginal cost to evaluate it of only about two, two and a half seconds. So that's why we were able to run like a whole MCMC chain, about 100,000 trials and several MCMC chains. Now you're wondering like what was the result of this? So the main result is shown here. I briefly recap the model parameters again, but the main result is that the gravity law parameter is very close to zero, which is consistent with the Newtonian result but rules out more than 16 sigma confidence. Now, the triangle plot is shown here. The important thing perhaps for you is the gravity law parameter, which is shown here. Um, basically, these ticks are at plus or minus 0.15, and all the probabilities basically within that range. There's no way that alpha graph can be anywhere close to one. Um, now, we looked at the uh, this study, which argued that the gamma parameter regarding the eccentricity distribution should be very close to 1.3. We didn't ask for that. We asked for it to be free between 0 to 4. But if you ask for it to be constrained, that will reduce the uncertainty on gamma, obviously, but it will not really affect, it, it does not really affect the other parameters. So uh, that's it, that didn't really change the infrared gravity law. Um, these other revisions to the model assumptions, again, also did not change the gravity law. So the inference on alpha graph is written in this column, and you can see it's all very close to zero. Um, so things like uh, these two rows show revised X, revised mass ratio distribution for the closed binaries. Uh, the differences are very small in those cases. Um, and the uh, quality of fit is also barely affected. Um, then uh, we tried having a narrow range of mass or equivalently of the mod radius of the white binary, which should mitigate some of the biases. Uh, but again, there wasn't much of an effect there. Uh, so that's this. So well, the uncertainties rose though, because you know, a few systems. Um, the most promising scenario is to substantially reduce the FCB parameter. That's kind of shifted the gravity law a little bit towards mod. So I'll explain why that doesn't work. The nominal model is in black and the revised one with FCB reduced to only 0.4, which is basically halving it, is shown in blue and the data is in, in red. So the, if you look at the VTL distribution in four different like R sky bins or ranges, you can see that the blue curve like completely misses the data it fails to reproduce pretty much all aspects of the observations. Um, the infrared gravity law is still like way closer to Newtonian gravity than to Mon, um, but the fit is also much worse. Uh, based on the uh, log likelihood, uh, the overall fit to the data is about 40 sigma worse than in the nominal analysis. So this unfortunately was a very bad idea. Um, now, what about like changing the interpolating function of MON to fit the white binary test? So we've um, basically I've written down the inferred uh, or the estimated like alpha graph in different theories uh, in here. It doesn't differ much between Kimon and Aqual, but the simple one, which is what we're using, gives by definition it predicts alpha graph equals one. The MLS function predicts about 0.9. This doesn't really matter much. Uh, but uh, the important thing to try and understand is what the rotation curves are telling you. So I have plotted on here the at fixed GN. I plotted the actual gravity at that GN. In part from rotation curves divided by, sorry, not the actual gravity. What I mean is I've, I've plotted the predicted gravity at that GN according to some interpolating function 
divided by the actual gravity at that GN inferred from sort of stacking different rotation curves on an RAR diagram. Um, what should happen is that this should be zero. Uh, well, this should be one and therefore the log should be zero. So a good intermediate function would be a flat line at zero. Uh, any kind of reasonable intermediate function will also do that within the uncertainties, uh, which the simple and the standard, sorry, the simple and the MLS ones do that. So the blue and black curves are more or less okay. I've shown the error bars only on the black one because of the same on the blue one. Uh, I didn't want to crowd the figure. Um, so these ones, however, both give uh, alpha gram about 0.9. So these are both uh, ruled out by the white binary test. If you try to use a standard interpolating function, that would marginally work with the white binary test, just. Uh, if you do that, you'd get this red curve, which completely misses the data on from rotation curves. So this is then uh, not correct, but um, what, I mean, the, the problem is that the white binary test is basically saying there's no enhancement of gravity at all in local white binaries, which means you want an infinitely sharp transition function. And this will work fine with the white binaries because locally the acceleration is slightly above A0. Um, so that will completely eliminate mond effects in the white binaries. And indeed, as I've shown here, the prediction for alpha gravity would be zero in that case, which would work but um, it would completely fail to miss the rotation curves. Uh, and by the way, the sun is about here on this uh, diagram. So, uh, yeah, uh, th there's no way to reconcile uh, MOND with uh, the white binary constraint with the disk galaxy area. Uh, it, that's not possible. Um, so, uh, in what I wanted to talk about briefly is the broader implications, if you think of MOND as like the neutron gravity of baryons plus some phantom dark matter, which is a purely mathematical construct that you can derive just from the baryonic density, uh, you can think of the white binary test as imposing a limit on the phantom dark matter density, which does arise in some models. Uh, and more, although they haven't phrased it like that, but their results lead to the same scaling as the limit on the PDM density. Um, more generally, a small scale cutoff to non standard effects in these modified gravity theories is not that unusual. Um, I'll come on to some uh, issues with that on the next slide. But first of all, I wanted to say that the limit to the density would need to be about 20 solar mass per cubic parsec or less, uh, which is only 0.1% of the galactic halo density. So, there, in principle, that's okay. Uh, now, in particular, it would all, it would basically prevent MON from correctly working in galaxies below about 10 to the 5 solar masses. However, there is no real data at such low masses. Uh, galactic scale tests only reach down to 10 to the 6 solar masses. Both these studies reach about 10 to the 6 solar masses, by the way, but they we can't really get below that now. So in principle, a phantom density limit like this may not affect galaxy rotation curves and things very much, velocity dispersions. Uh, the problem is, uh, well, one possible problem with MON has been raised in a distant halo globular cluster. It's about 90 kiloparsec away. Um, so, but th and that's at a mass slightly below 10 to the 6 solar masses. So it could be that MON does indeed sort of break down at very low masses. That's not impossible, uh, but uh, I wanted to explain some uh, other problems in the last few minutes. Um, one recent problem related to the previous week's talk is the tidal stability of ultrafade Milky Way satellites. So to quantify this, we divide the half mass radius by the tidal radius, which is the maximum size it could have for it to be stable uh, at pericenter. And this is found just by equating the gravity of the dwarf, which is G m over R squared times the extra enhancement factor in one. Uh, basically related to the local galactic external field on the dwarf. Uh, that has to be equated with the tidal stress from the Milky Way, the derivative of its gravity times the size of the dwarf. So this will lead to uh, a cube root scaling, basically, like better R cubed equals G nu M over G dash. Um, now, 
if you do that, um, that, so that, that's like an analytic result, but uh, with, there's a, in, you can tell that there could be an extra numerical factor in front of this, right? Um, which we found using numerical sil simulations. Uh, the critical threshold rises with eccentricity because there's less time spent at barycentric. <laughs> but basically, the I mean, we only have these three points. I'm assuming conservatively that it stays flat below the, this point. So, so it's gone flat there, where it's, it's also very flat afterwards until here, where it rises slightly. The main thing, though, is that many satellites are above this point, uh, this uh, line. So um, it's hard to be sure Boots 1 would be unstable in mod, but anything like Segway 1 or above, so all these objects should be unstable in mod. Uh, and this one especially uh, also because we have an evaluation at basically the same uh, eccentricity in LNS paper on Fornax cluster dwarfs. So uh, that's one major issue. The uh, other major issue is related to large scale structure simulations. Uh, where just briefly on large scales, one needs to include a hot dark matter component to match galaxy clusters, but without affecting the rotation curves of galaxies. Um, so things like the polar cluster, but also many other clusters and the CMB and isotropies, which actually work quite well in MOD because the gravity is about 20 A0. So the gravity law doesn't matter much. And the expansion history is also standard uh, and free streaming effects are not too significant for such a hot dark matter component. In the CMB, but free streaming effects also affect many other things. So in particular, power is strongly suppressed on small scales because you don't have any cold dark matter. This leads to the first galaxies forming at redshift four uh, in this study, which has almost been accepted. Some minor revisions requested. And also, you don't get very many low mass galaxy clusters, the present epoch. Um, so you can kind of see that if you compare these panels, which show redshift zero, but this left one is Lambda C and this right one is new HDN, which is this MOND cosmology. Um, new, uh, I've explained earlier what that means. This is the HDN. So you uh, have basically a serious problem with matching large scale structure, uh, especially given the failure of the score distance loss uh, East model, which I uh, explained earlier, um, uh, at least gave a reference for earlier. So. Uh, yeah, that, that brings me on to like uh, this one conference which we're organizing uh, in uh, early June. Um, so we've prepared this nice logo for it. When you can find it online, uh, just search for this phrase. Um, the uh, thing is, um, MON was originally designed for this galaxy rotation curves, uh, but um, successes beyond like equilibrium galaxy dynamics are highly questionable. There's no real very clear success beyond that. Uh, more importantly, recent results falsify uh, important either a priori predictions like with the wide binary test or at least outcomes. Uh, what ha once we have enough computing power to simulate the equations that were written down, uh, like with the hydrodynamical cosmological simulations uh, done by Neil, led by Niels Wittenberg in Bonn. Um, so recent results falsify so many important aspects of MON. Uh, so this is essentially the current situation where we basically have like a trident sort of being stabbed into this modern bubble, um, which where you have wide binaries, as I was talking about, but also ultra faint satellites around the Milky Way, only discovered recently, uh, many of them, and large scale structure formation. So all very recent problems we didn't know about like even half a year ago. Um, I mean, we thought they might become problematic, but we didn't know they would. Um, so, that uh, brings me on to my uh, conclusion slide, um, which is that um, a, in uh, bond, um, local wide binaries should orbit 20% faster than the Newtonian expectation. Uh, but this, unfortunately, is not correct. And also, there was a similar study by Pitotis and Sutherland, which has recently been published in the Open Journal of Astrophysics. Uh, so, in case you're trying to avoid the fees at MNRS, you can try and of their lead. Um, but the basic thing is that you have like 
a, a sort of a confirmation of our result using sort of less rigorous, less robust method, less thorough exploration of the parameter space, but the result is very similar. Um, there's no way to reconcile Mon as modified gravity with both the disk galaxy rotation curves in area and also the white binary test. Um, if you try to argue Mon is modified inertia, uh, I uh, think I presented here a while back, but there is a failure of that seven sigma confidence in this uh, application. So that also doesn't work. Um, you need at least one new fundamental constant beyond A0 to keep Mon sort of alive, such as a new phantom dark matter density scale, a new maximum to the phantom dark matter density, which wouldn't cause any obvious tension with galaxy dynamics. But uh, there are additional problems for Mon that are very serious in nature. Um, so the stability of ultra faint Milky Way satellites, uh, which really suggests they need protection from sort of dark halo. And structure formation also really does not work in Mon. Um, unless there is some breakthrough, which is possible, uh, that um, there will be some positive developments at the conference, uh, but certainly at the moment it, it looks quite uh, difficult to reconcile Mon with available constraints. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for listening. I see we have, okay, Philip has his hand up online. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. I'm not sure he can hear me from there. But. Uh, Philip, I can take your question if you want. Hello. Hang on, I'll ping in. Um, anyone else want to ask in the meantime? Uh, go ahead. Now that you've definitively ruled out MOND, what will you work on next? Uh, I, I'm not completely sure. Like in the short run, I would want to work on uh, like doing sort of numerical simulations, perhaps with collaborating in Strasbourg of, I think of Segway 1, and then it will show that basically if that's unstable, everything above it will be unstable and writing up something related to that. And also the wide binary results we have written up address referee concerns after that I'm not completely sure um. oh, okay yes um I've I've got a microphone with me. um yeah first of all I'd like to thank Ian and Nick for setting me up to join in um I want to make two comments comment number one um Whatever you want to say about MOND, it remains true, and you saw it from the RAR, yeah. that you get departures from the luminous Newton when you drop below A0. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a, that, that curve on the right, that's a property of nature. I mean, that's, I call that Milgram's law. That is absolutely correct. Accelerations drop below that point, you see a departure from luminous Newton. Yeah. Now, you can argue as to how the function should behave when you go below R0, which I think is mainly what you're discussing today, but that first result is, is, is really there. It's a property of nature. Now, the second question I have is, how big is the EFE? It seems to me that it might be the driver in what you're doing because it's not really an issue of whether the two, two stars in the binary are in the Mond regime. It's their accelerations with respect to the entire galaxy that puts them in the Mond regime. And then the question is, is it the, e is it the EFE that's causing the problem? Or, is it, or, is it, or can you just say that the theory is not good, which I think is what you're saying, but maybe the EFE is being totally overestimated. And to see whether it is overestimated, have you calculated what it would do to the motion of Jupiter? 
if you think of Jupiter and the Sun as near to a close binary. Right. So I, let me uh, address uh, first of all. I'll come on to the planet question second. If you ask that second. So for the um, EFE case, uh, yes, we already include the EFE from the Milky Way in the calculations. If you have a um, stronger EFE, that would reduce the MON signal, uh, the predicted MON signal, which would make it, in theory, even more consistent with the data. Uh, but the galactic external field on the solar neighborhood is extremely well constrained by now because uh, we know the rotation curve quite accurately. And also recently, we measured the acceleration of the solar system directly relative to distant quasars using the changing aberration angle. Um, so the EFE is very important in MON, but we did include that uh, in some detail. Um, now, regarding the other question, like I will answer this like instead for the Saturn case, because there's more strong constraints regarding the Earth Saturn range, thanks to the Cassini mission. Um, there, the main effect of MON, again, is due to the EFE. In particular, um, in MON, there is not much phantom dark matter in the solar system, uh, but there would be sort of a thick shell of phantom dark matter at about the MON radius, and it would be not spherically symmetric because of the galactic external field. As a result, there would be a tidal stress on the solar system, um, and this would uh, create a, the anomalous tidal stress that's predicted to occur is marginally compatible with solar system bounds. But I think there's some efforts underway to like recalculate exactly what MON predicts using the most up-to-date values for the external field and A0. Um, but yeah, there, there it, is, it is consistent. It is possible if, Though that in future, with further improvements, if that if Mon really is completely correct, then you, that you'd be able to detect the anomalous tidal stress created by Mon on the inner solar system. Okay. Okay, so we're coming up to the hour. If anyone has one final quick question, there's certainly time for. Um, actually, I have one which might be super quick. Yep. So, um, so does it specifically have to be hot dark matter if you're adding? Well, uh, there is uh, some wiggle room. Um, so, in particular, um, it's been shown that um, in order to avoid uh, a affecting or degrading the rotation curve fits in galaxies, um, you can have a particle with a mass of up to 300 electron volts of a C squared. So typically with this hot dark matter, we mean uh, an 11 electron volt sterile neutrino. But in theory, it could be up to 300 eV. You would have to keep the mass density the same though. So it would have to be at 11 eV, if it was thermalized, the mass density would come out sort of right. If it was 300 dB, you'd have to assume it's non-thermal, but in principle, this somewhat warmer dark matter cosmology would not uh, affect rotation curves, and therefore, it, in theory, it would still be reasonable. Um, the thing is, like uh, we've done some preliminary calculations uh, that Alfie has, Russell has done, which show that this problem would probably persist even in that case, okay. but and at a higher mass. Um, it may be solved, but that doesn't ma matter because then the rotation curves would start to fail. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, let's give it a nice big round of applause. Thank you. Right.